good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone across the Zoom Dome and around the world. You're welcome to the March 2023 edition of the African Literature Association Lecture Series held today on April 1st. My name is Akin Adeshokan. I teach comparative literature and African cinema at Indiana University Bloomington. And it has been my pleasure over the past three years to coordinate this series with my colleagues in the Executive Council of the Association, especially Matthew Brown of the University of Wisconsin uh, in Madison and James McCorkle of William and Hobart College in Geneva, New York. The series began two years ago at the height of the COVID pandemic, forcing a global lockdown, but it was also an imaginative initiative suggested by the president of the association at the time, that is uh, Grima Negash of Ohio State University. And it's been, it has continued to receive the support of the executive council and particularly of the subsequent presidents, Mohammed Kamara of Washington and Lee University and Gaurav Desai of the University of Michigan, who is our current president and a co-organizer of the series. We also acknowledge the technical support of Alexis Lagendorf, who is a web development assistant. In the main, the lecture series is meant to engage the members' intellectual and professional attention outside of the conference calendar, and it has had the benefit of opening literary studies up to other areas of the study of artistic expression, moving on to those fields in the humanities and the social sciences invested in the generation of knowledge in all spheres of life. Uh, we are getting there, and those in attendance who may be new to the series are encouraged to view past review to review past lectures dating back to September 2020 to get a sense of the diversity of the subjects and scholars featured. As always, we acknowledge the continuing support of other members of the council, as well as the larger membership of the association. Due to your continuing attention and attendance, the series has come to stand in the past year, in the past two years, as a publicly engaged feature of the association's presence. In this age, when public engagement is roughly equivalent to being socially or civically responsive, we thank you all. Our guests today are scholars in the wider field of the social sciences, from anthropology and health science. Professor Laurie Leonard is a global development specialist with focus on social and environmental issues. And Professor Omolade Adumbi is a, polit a, polit is a political and anthropologist environmentalist. They have both recently produced work that engage with, with extraction, environmental politics and similar other questions. Their, their presence today affirms the point I made a moment ago about ALA's interest in dialogue with scholars outside of literary studies. This connection goes beyond simple representation of depiction or depiction of environmental issues in literature. For example, to embrace the live experience of productive or wasteful society wasteful forces in society, such as oil bunkering or smuggling, for example, and how such recognition breaks down the hard and fast boundaries between fields and disciplines. Our first speaker will be Omolade Adobi, a political and environmental anthropologist and professor of Afro-American and African studies, a professor of law and director of the African Studies Center at the University of Michigan. He's faculty associate in the program in the environment and the energy institute at the university in Ann Arbor. His areas of research explore issues related to governance, infrastructures of extraction, environmental politics and rights, power, violence, culture, and transnational institutions. His book, Oil, Wealth, and Insurgency in Nigeria, which came out of Indiana University Press in 2015, won the 2017 Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland Amori Talbot Book Award in the, for the best book in anthropology in Africa. His latest book, Enclaves of Exception, Special Economic Zones and Extractive Practices in Nigeria, interrogates the idea of free trade zones and its interrelatedness to oil refining practices, infrastructures, and China's engagement with Africa. Our second speaker is Professor Lori Leonard, a professor and inaugural chair in the Department of Global Development at Cornell University. She has been a scholar in residence at the Rockefeller Foundation at, in Bellagio, Italy, and at the Woodrow Wilson 
International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. She's the author of Life in the Time of Oil, A Pipeline and Poverty in Chad, and numerous other publications, among the most recent being Gazomania, Shortage and the State in Chad, published in 2022. Uh, we'll start with Professor Adobe. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Atishoko, for the uh, wonderful introduction. And thanks to the African Literature Association, uh, the executive board, and all the members for giving me the opportunity to uh, share my ideas with you this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you might be. Uh, I've got to share my slide. Can everyone see my slide? Okay. So what I'm going to share with you this morning is uh, uh, coming out of uh, my recently released book, as uh, Professor Adesoko mentioned earlier on. And uh, the book is titled Enclaves of Exception, Special Economic Zones and Extractive Practices in Nigeria. And what I intend to do is uh, uh, to share what I consider to be the main arguments of the book with you, then go ahead to, uh, to describe some of the uh, 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 materials that I used in uh, uh, by writing the book with you. And what I mean by some of the materials are the ethnographic evidence that I collected uh, in the sites where I did the research for the book. So basically in this book, I examined the notion of special economic zones in ways that complicate its meaning and practice in extractive enclaves such as Nigeria. And using an ethnographic examination of uh, at the Lekki Free Trade Zone, the Ogungwanjong Free Trade Zone, and the Po Fire artisanal refineries in the Niger Delta Creeks, I pay particular attention to how special economic zones have produced the same environmental outcomes for communities in which they are located. And I frame my broader arguments around the following interrelated ideas. First, I rethink SEZs and their relationship to oil extraction and state systems that regulate them. My suggestion is that if special economic zones are zones of exception, specially designated to have their own regulatory and fiscal regimes that differ from that of the state, we shall see regulatory practices of extraction by youths in the creeks of the Niger Delta as also constitutive of zones of exception where special economic activities also shape daily lived experiences of uh, uh, the residents. Basically, what I'm trying to suggest here is that uh, in most literature, in most academic literature, special economic zones are seen as something that can be regulated and produced by the state. But now I am arguing the contrary, that it is not only the state that can establish special economic zones, that there are also non-state actors who can establish special economic zones, and that if those special economic zones established by non-state actors are producing economic activities, then we should also see them as constitutive of special economic zones. Then the second is that if special economic zones are aimed at boosting economies and helping build infrastructure where they are deficient, then we should also consider the SEZs established in the creeks of the Delta by disenfranchised and displaced youth as a form of constructing oil infrastructure that might mimic state and multinational corporations. Then I use the term infrastructure here to describe a system of organization that revolves around the exploitation production, marketing, and institutionalization of oil as a local and international business commodity. Third, I extend the notion of energy as a state and corporate capture to include what I call crude capture and recapture. 
So crude capture and recapture encompasses a system of energy techniques within enclaves of exception, within enclaves of exception, by youths and former insurgents in the creeks of the Delta. Crude capture and recapture challenges the notion that oil requires more technology and fewer workers, especially, especially expatriate workers. And here I'm uh, 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 taking a cue from uh, my colleague, Professor Lena, uh, Laurie Leonard, who is joining us today, uh, based on our work on uh, oil extraction in Chad. And I'm also looking at the work of uh, Anna Appel, for example, and uh, 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 Christine Doughty, all of, the, all of whom have written about extractive practices in different locations in Africa. So the shift from these practices to that of crude capture and recapture through artisanal refineries also meant, as I suggest in the book, a shift in the techniques of extraction. So put together, it is this new moment in resource extraction that is producing what I call the social death of the environment. And the question that I ask is, how do these techniques of extraction result in the social death of the environment? And to answer these questions, I weave together stories and evidence of environmental degradation within communities of extraction at the Lekki Free Trade Zones, Ogungonjan Free Trade Zones, as well as uh, the artisanal refineries in the creeks of the Niger Delta. So to give a proper context here, so the Lekki Free Trade Zone, which is, as you can see in the image displayed here, is considered to be the cradle of new drains. And the zone is operate owned and operated by a consortium of Chinese uh, uh, entrepreneurs and businesses in collaboration with the government of Lagos State. Then the Ogunguanjong Free Trade Zone, which is also a few kilometers away from where Lekki Free Trade Zone is located, is also operated and, uh, by a consortium of Chinese uh, entrepreneurs as well as uh, 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 the, Lagos, uh, the Ogun State government. Then what is unique about the Lekki Free Trade Zone is that there is also a Nigerian entrepreneur who decided to situate his business within the Lekki Free Trade Zone. And that entrepreneur is Mr. Aliko Dangote. So within the trade zone, we also have the Dangote Petrochemical Refinery which uh, uh, is also going to come on stream very soon in Lagos State. So next, I want to describe some of the uh, uh, materials that I collected while uh, 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 doing research in the region. So one afternoon, after I spent several hours with my interlocutors at the Ogunguanjong Free Trade Zone, my Chinese host invited me to lunch at one of the restaurants in the zone. My research assistant, Fate, whose car we used for transport, was asked to drive along while I joined my Chinese friends, James and John, and I'm using James and John as pseudo names here. Along the road, James and John pointed at some of the sites being developed by new enterprises that had just been licensed to operate in the zone. James pointed out that since the construction work was at an advanced stage, very soon these new enterprises will come online and add to the number already manufacturing consumer products within the free trade zone. The ride took about five minutes, and as soon as we alighted from the car, many of the staff stood, stood up to welcome me and my host to the restaurant. And by the way, many of the staff in the restaurant are Nigerians who now have perfected the way of uh, making Chinese food for the restaurant. James and John are two of the bosses in the zone, hence the respect accorded them by the Nigerian staffer at the restaurant. Shortly after, we settled for lunch, mainly Chinese food prepared by Nigerian chefs. As soon as lunch was served, I reminded James and John that we needed to continue the conversation we started in their office, where I had asked them what they saw as the advantages of doing business in Nigeria. John responded with a curious answer, quote, Nigeria is like 18th century China, and we are here to help fast track its movement to the 21st century, end of quote. 
Curious as this assertion might be, it reminded me of the works of Eric Warby and Deborah Brotherhams, who had uh, uh, taken on the, the question of development and Africa's and what is known as the Africa's Eastern Promise. So Warby pointed out the dangers of state inscribed development for communities through the example of Zimbabwe, particularly in the Gokwe region where new agricultural practices were introduced as part of the state's interest in fast tracking development that provided little benefit to the population. In the same vein, John's comment about transforming Nigeria, which resembles to him 18th century China, into a modern world represents what Brotherham calls Africa's Eastern promise. An African's Eastern promise is the notion of an, of, is, is it, is it, sorry, African Eastern promise is a term variously used to describe the new engagement with China, which seems to fit well with John's narrative that Africa and Nigeria is still in the 18th century and requires some foreign interest or power to rescue it and move it forward to the era of modernization. While John seemed oblivious to the deeper meaning of his comment, the actions and inactions of practitioners in free trade zones are not lost on many of the communities that are host to these zones. And one of such is the construction of uh, uh, the refinery that is being uh, spearheaded by Mr. Alikudangote. So therefore, many who use their land for farming, including those in Igbesa, which is where the Ogunbonjong free trade zone is, or the fishermen and farmers around, around Idasho in Leki, face displacement from their land and livelihood as a result of the construction of free trade zones in those spaces. As many communities, community members in Indasha confided during one of my several visits to the area, the life to, they live today is comparable to the life in hell. When asked why hell, one interlocutor who, who I named Mrs. Adebisi, popularly known as Mama Jumi, or mother of Jumi told me one morning while I was having breakfast with her family, quote, although we've never been to hell, but from what we learn, it is not a habitable, it is not a habitable place. It's a place reserved for those who have offended God and they are expected to spend eternity there. So Mama Jumi may never have been to hell, but our understanding of it, and its resonance with the daily lived experiences of members of our, of our community seems apt. An important episode that many members of the community recall during conversations about the FTZ was the threat by the former governor of Lagos State, who is now Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babatunde Fashola, during his visit to the community in 2014. While speaking to some leaders, of various communities in the area in the Yoruba language, Governor Fashola stated that whoever did not want the refinery, that is the Dangote refinery that is almost completed now, whoever do not want the refinery to be sited in the area should leave. And he asked in Yoruba, who wants the refinery? In a video published by many newspapers, particularly Sahara reporters during this period, there seems to be an overwhelming, we do not want the refinery from the crowd. And the governor's response was, whether you like it or not, the free trade zone and the refinery will be built. To Mama Jumi and many community members, this obvious threat has been incrementally carried out since 2014 with the displacement of many in the area to make way for the refinery. The promise of the refinery owned by Africa's richest person, Mr. Alikodangote, located within an FTZ where enterprises are not encumbered by state regulatory practices is insightful. On the one hand, the FTZ is a collaboration between a Chinese consortium and the Lagos state government. On the other hand, Dangote is allowed to site its refinery within the zone as part of Lagos State's investment strategy. 
Basically, FTZs present certain benefits that are not available to enterprises located outside their bounds. Hence, the motivation for Dangote to locate its refinery within an FTZ. Yet, the FTZ's promise of employment opportunities for members of the community has become a mirage, as many of my interlocutors told me. What has become a reality for them is pollution and displacement. Moreover, by the time the refinery comes online, which is going to happen this year, as promised by Mr. Dangote, pollution from the refinery will combine with pollution from other enterprises to double, if not triple, pollutant levels within the free trade zone and the surrounding communities. So now to the other example, which are the artisanal refineries. So crude oil contains relatively high quantities of sulfur. When crude oil is heated to produce fuel, the sulfur is converted into a colorless gas called sulfur dioxide with a very strong smell akin to rotten eggs. Exposure to a very high concentration of SO2s, for example, when there are accidental leaks at the refinery, can result in painful irritation of the eyes, nose, mouth, and throat, difficulty breathing, nausea, vomiting, headaches, and even death. Some of the health effects from daily exposure to outdoor levels of SO2s include tight chest, worsening of asthma, and lung disease. And many have reported that it could also lead to cancer. So while artisanal refineries thrive in many places across the Niger Delta, there also exist many challenges that can turn the refining process into a nightmare for the environment and neighboring communities, one of which is uh, the health effect that it produces. So, and here is what I come to, uh, what I term the social death of the environment. So when artisanal refineries produce oil in an artisanal way, and uh, it pollutes the environment, the resultant effect is what I call the social death of the environment, which is experienced in the areas where artisanal refineries are located. And this constitutes challenges for the practitioners and inhabitants of resource enclaves. So the many sites of artisanal refineries, one of which you are looking at uh, in the image displayed. So the many sites show clearly the level of damage caused to the environment and livelihood practices within these communities. So the camp at Ohaihi, in Bielsa exemplifies this form of social death of the environment. At the camp, the stench of crude oil permeates the entire site, which contains over 45 enterprises. Workers at the site often wear only their underwear, and of course, 99% of the workers are male. While in their underwear, they use bare hands to ferry buckets of uh, crude oil into of crude oil into uh, the cooking pot that is used to produce the oil. In most cases, some of the crude that has been left out for a long period of time has transformed into a solid state that resembles big stones inside and outside the campsite. All over the camp, the trees that are still left standing look like unfamiliar objects stained with a brown substance, as you can see in the image here. Concerns about the environment are secondary to operators of the refineries. When asked if they are concerned about this damage, many respond that the major oil corporations have been doing the same for more than 50 years. And they are not seriously bothered by this degradation because they are simply earning income from the natural resource they are endowed with. And the environment is not the only casualty here. People, including those who work in the camps, are also victims of the social death of the environment. 
The health effects of daily exposure to crude oil that is cooked in the refining process cannot be overemphasized. While there has been no scientific study on possible causal relationships between exposure to naked fire from refinery operations and illness in the region, many workers have reported to me that after much inhalation of the thick smog that, gets, that they get sick. When they are sick, they spend their off days resting before returning to work. More importantly, one of the major devastating effects of oil exploration by corporations, which has also been further compounded by artisanal refineries, is the prevalence of soot in many Niger Delta communities. In every community that I visited while doing research for this book, I saw the impact of soot on the environment. Small particles of a blackish object fly around and some are concentrated on rooftops, walls, and any visible object within these communities. Many of my interlocutors complain that while soot has always been around in the Niger Delta since the inception of oil exploration, it has become worse in the last few years as a result of the activities of artisanal refiners. As Whiteman and Marsha contends, soot is the common term for a type of particle pollution called PM2.5, that is particulate matter that is 2.5 micrometers in diameter or smaller. Such fine particles are even smaller than dust and mold particles, or approximately one over 30 of the size of a human ear. It is comprised of a variety of pollutants, including chemicals, acids, metals, soils, and dust, which are suspended in the air after emission. And soot can come in solid, liquid, or gaseous states. While many claim that the effect of soot on their health has been devastating, they are justifiably right. For instance, the United States Environmental Protection Agency suggests soot as microscopic particles can that can penetrate deep into the lungs and have been linked to a wide range of serious health effects, including premature death, heart attacks, and strokes, as well as acute bronchitis and aggravated asthma among children. And the American Lungs Association corroborates this with its warning that exposure to soot can potentially cause cancer and developmental and reproductive harm. So the effect on Niger Delta farming, as well as communities in Lagos that are host to Dangote refineries can be devastating. This is because particle pollution is also correlated to acid rain. The same compounds from soot can react in the air to form ACE. Sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides can mix with atmospheric moisture to acidify precipitation. Carried by the wind or in the water, this acidified pollution degrades water quality by making lakes and rivers more acidic, depleting the nutrients in the soil and damaging, sens damaging sensitive farm crops and changing the nutrient balance in river basins, along coastlines, and in forests. So the ample, ample impact of corporate extraction of oil and artisanal refinery practices are enormous. The enormity of the environmental consequences is akin to being suffocated, hence the condemnation of the environment and the people who inhabit it into a social death. So to conclude, therefore, the environment has become the genus of the resource enclaves of Nigeria. Like the double-faced Greek god of beginnings and endings, the environment is con constantly being defined and redefined through this constant struggle for its control, control by the state, its corporate partners, and the operators of artisanal refineries. Today, nature's perception has become an intertwined matrix that reinforces practices aimed at exploiting it to its own detriment. The environment has become a form of simulacra, where state and corporate mimicry aimed at producing an original practice end up reinforcing practices that reshape what looks like the original thing 
while also condemning it to its social death and precluding any ability to create sustainable social change. Extractive enclaves and their practices sometimes function as separate, emblematic, and thus pliable entities with the capacity to become sites for experimentation. It is this form of experimentation that enclaves such as the campsites in many creeks of the Niger Delta have allowed in recent times. So the emergence of these creeks as sites for artisanal refining practices provides an exceptional example of how the concepts of corporate mimicry can be appropriated in ways that can similarly result in the social death of the environment. At the same time, the spaces of the free trade zones in Lagos and Ogun also provide environmental challenges akin to those of the artisanal refineries. Pollution is universal in meaning and practices to both sites of extraction. FTZs are sites of extraction of economic value that encompasses refining and manufacturing as well as artisanal refineries as sites of extraction of purely oil are both detrimental to the environment and the people that inhabit them. And as one of the elders in one of the communities told me, we are dead, but we are not also dead. Death in this sense becomes a metaphor for how life can present itself as death to people, even when they are still alive. Life in this sense becomes ephemeral in all intents and purposes. The environment that for many hundreds of years served as a site for livelihood practices and healthy living has now become a site where people on a daily basis think about the evanescence of life itself. From the creeks of oil to the enclaves of free trade zones, the story remains the same. The people and environment experience social death every passing day. Thank you. Well, thank you. Very fascinating. Uh, I'm very eloquent too. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Lori Leonard, who is going to be speaking about her current work on the environmental issues and oil exploration and the uh, gas pipeline in Chad and other related issues. So, uh, please, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... First, I want to also say thank you to the African Literature Association and to you, um, Professor Adesokan, for the invitation. Very much appreciated. And I'm particularly happy to be here with Lade, who uh, Lade and I have sort of worked next door to each other in Nigeria and in Chad um, over now a couple of decades. Um, and uh, sort of been on many, many panels and had lots of joint invitations to talk about extractive industries. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be um, here with him today. Um, I also um, just wanted to comment on the introduction and about the, the outreach of a group like the African Literature Association to um, social scientists and to others. I um, I was uh, an English major as an undergraduate, and I think that those um, those sensibilities have never left me. I I, I believe in in good writing. Um, I'm part of a group at Cornell that um, uh, it's actually a, a group of historians, but uh, it's called Historians Are Writers, and it's a group of academics who really think about. Um, uh, writing good stories, you know, no matter what discipline you're in. Uh, and I think that's really important. And it's something that I um, tried to keep at the forefront in the book that I'm talking about today. So I thought I would start by just um, saying a little bit about the motivation um, for Life in the Time of Oil, um, which is the, the book I wrote about um, the pipeline project in Chad. Um, I had worked in Chad for many decades. I started there as a Peace Corps volunteer in the 1980s, um, did a lot of work when I was at schools of public health um, in Chad. And always in the background, there was a narrative about oil as, um, uh, as the future. Oil as um, the thing that, uh, th th you know, there was uh, a lot of uh, drilling companies and exploration companies that were physically present in Chad in the 80s and the 90s. 
Um, and it was always, uh, you know, about the future. The villages that I ended up working in took care of test wells, you know, test wells that Parker Drilling and other, um, you know, uh, drilling companies from around the world had come and had, uh, had, had, they were the test wells that they had created. Um, and these, these villages kept, you know, took care of them over decades because they were told, this is your future. You're going to be rich someday. This is going to, you know, th th this is going to transform your life. So there was always that. Um, and, you know, th th these, these, this infrastructure sort of lay dormant for several decades. And then the other sort of narrative that came out was the World Bank's narrative and the narrative that the oil companies, which was a consortium of companies led by ExxonMobil took up. And that was, um, this was the model oil as development, oil as social and economic development project. Um, and it was considered the model because um, at the time, Chad really had no negotiating capacity. And so the World Bank um, laid out a set of what were supposed to be model policies for how <clears throat> a low-income country managed an extractive industry project. There was a very long history of extractive industry projects on the African continent failing. And this one was supposed to be different. And it was supposed to be different because it had um, lots of lots of policies attached to it written by the World Bank. There was a um, there was a revenue management law which dictated how the government of Chad would use its oil revenues. There were, there were policies about employment and about what happened after you laid people off. There were policies about waste management. There were policies about compensation. There were policies about resettlement. The, the, it was an, it was, there were tomes that were written about how this project was gonna be managed. And the idea was that if it were properly managed, it could be um, a model oil as development project that would be replicated in all other parts of the continent. And so I thought, well, you know, given those two narratives, one, you know, coming out of villages about the future, oil as the future, and the other, um, the, here is this model oil as development project. It would be really important to capture what this project did, um, what it brought to people, what happened. And so I started following it um, in 2000. And I'll just say a little bit about how the book came to be. Um, it's based on 12 years of pretty intensive field work in Chad. I spent, I'd say, three to four months in Chad over that period of time from 2000 to 2012 and beyond. But that was that, that was really the bulk of the ethnographic field work. And initially, it was cast as a broader project. I was going to follow families, some in Njemena, capital city, some in the regional capital of Bebeja, which is where a lot of um, the workers for the project came from. And then um, the half of those, about 80 families in the villages of the oil field region, where most of the, most of the infrastructure for the project existed. I ended up really focusing, and the book really focuses on the oil field region itself, because the effects were the most immediate, they were the most profound, um, they were the most tangible. So um, I, you know, I, I was really interested in how the project embedded itself in people's lives, in their identities, in their bodies, in their relationships. And so I worked with um, a, a group of uh, research assistants, and we went to, um, we checked in on families every week. And we did uh, a broad range of things. Um, Clifford Geertz described the kind of data I collect, and I'm just going to read you a very brief paragraph, as convergent data. And he, he says, by convergent data, I mean descriptions, measures, observations, what you will, which are at once diverse, even rather miscellaneous, both as to type and degree of precision and generality, unstandardized facts, opportunistically collected and variously portrayed, which yet turn out to shed light on one another for the simple reason that the individuals they are descriptions, measures, or observations of are directly involved in each other's lives. So we collected, I mean, we collected everything from, we did soil sampling, we did um, surveys about farm animals, surveys about household income, health status, food security, employment, 
went, we did village histories, we mapped the routes that people, people walked when they went to families' houses or to their fields, we tested children for anemia, we did a really wide range of things over those 12 years. But I think the most important thing about the data collection is that we were actually there, we were interacting with families every week, even when I wasn't there, right, we were interacting with families, so we knew what was going on, we knew what was preoccupying them. We knew what stories they were telling. Um, and so the chapters really, um, they, each of them tells a different part of the story. And I will, I'll give you just a, um, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them. And I'm going to show, I'm going to show a slide if I can do that here. Share screen. Okay. Um, so one of the Okay, there you go. One of them, um, one of the chapters is called In the Midst of Things, and it is, it's really about the oil company's waste management plan. So one of these sort of standard model policies was around waste management. And the idea was, how does a, how does a big oil project, a massive oil project, which is going to create a lot of junk, Right? How do how do how does an oil company get rid of that in a way that's not environmentally detrimental? And so there was a very complicated um, uh, environmental management plan, and part of that environmental management plan um, involved donating um, non-hazardous waste, and I'm air quoting a lot of these words, um, to uh, villages in the oil field region. And so there were regularly these, and the idea was that, you know, people might be able to use some of these things that may uh, still not be, or may no longer be useful to the oil companies. Um, so there would be regular dumps of this material, and you would begin to see it all over the oil field region. This is a door that was made out of a packing crate. Um, this is, you know, that caution construction tape that people use. Some of this is just aesthetic use. Some of it is very practical utilitarian use, right, that was used for a curtain um, in someone's door. Um, these were, uh, these used to be sort of placards and signs that were alongside the road and people would dismantle them and turn them into tables that were very useful to them. Um, this is a shipping crate that um, they converted into the office um, for the, the chef de canton, the, the chief of the, of the, of the region. Um, and so, um, I'm going to stop sharing so I can, there you go, um, so I can talk to you. Um, so there were a whole range of these pro uh, uh, products or pieces of, of material, objects that were circulating um, in the oil field region. And one of the, what this did, which was, I think, completely unexpected, was that um, it became very difficult for people to differentiate between property, what was the property of the oil companies and therefore, you know, supposed to be under guard, and what was waste. Um, you know, piece of wood, how can you tell if that is property or that is waste? A jerry can, how can you tell if that is, you know, still something that's of use and of value to the oil companies or if it's waste? And if you can't distinguish between property and waste, then how can you tell the difference between a beneficiary and a thief, right? And so there was this sort of miasma <laughs> that spread across the oil field region and people became um, really nervous about having any of this stuff in their possession because it was always unclear um, whether it was property or waste, not to them. They always knew that it was waste and they had picked it up, but whether they were going to be construed as a beneficiary or as a thief. And so it extended sort of the range of surveillance um, from um, you know, very, very finite sites where infrastructure was to the entire oil field region, people's homes and houses and concessions, where there would be raids, and this stuff would be recollected at certain moments in time. So one of the chapters uh, in the book is about that. Another is about um, the the ways in which this project shifted people's relationship to the land and to nature and also to each other. 
Um, the compensation and resettlement plan was probably one of the most impactful model policies um, in, the, uh, in the project. And what it, it, it laid out the terms under which people would be compensated for, um, for the loss of, of land. And effectively, they were not compensated for land because the oil companies um, uh, said, you know, people don't own the land, the state owns the land, which is a very contentious statement. So people were compensated for their labor on the land, which included the loss of crops and the loss of trees. Um, so, but in order to be eligible for compensation, you had to clear the land, you had to show that you were working it, that you were rendering it productive. Um, and so, uh, and they produced a table that had values for crops, for different kinds of crops, for cotton, for food crops, but also for different species of trees, for karité trees, mango trees, all of them had a different price. This changed the way that people thought about land and land resources. Um, and it changed the way that people related to each other. The people who could uh, could plow land and could plant land and could in, in, in large, you know, over a large scale became primary rights holders, right? Because they were the people who got uh, the, they could, they could capture uh, the compensation payments that the oil companies were providing. Other people became dependents, right? People who relied on those people who could render that land in at least, you know, uh, in the eyes of the oil companies as a field. It was no longer just fallow land. It was actually a field someone was producing on, that someone was growing crops on, and that therefore would generate a compensation payment. And so these relationships in families um, uh, shifted. Um, also, uh, um, the, the land itself, there were lots of fights over high, you know, high value land, land that had lots of trees on it, because trees were typically um, the most, uh, the most consequential part of a compensation payment. So land with lots of trees would generate a very large payment. There were lots of fights about trees on borders of fields or trees on, um, uh, you know, wooded land. Um, I would say that the the, the book is, it, it really tells, it, it operates on two registers. One is to talk about the experience from the perspective of these, of these families. And the other is, to, is to, um, to analyze how the companies operated um, in such a way that um, they were incredibly efficient. I mean, one of the remarkable um, facts of this project is that it produced oil a full year ahead of schedule. Um, and they were the monitoring bodies would constantly remark on what they called the two speed problem. And they, they were always focused on how slow the government was, right? How slow the government of Chad was to enact some of these measures um, to respond to certain things. Um, but I, what I was interested in was how efficient the oil companies were. How did they pull off this project um, with such rapidity and with such speed? And um, I'll talk just about, uh, about two themes today. Um, one was, you know, what I called um, domesticating disputes, right? The oil companies, and, and there, there are two, um, two aspects to that. One was to sort of tame disputes, to tame disputes by sort of teaching people how to complain, teaching people how to present their grievances to the consortium, what language they should use and what framing they um, could use in order for those claims to be adjudicated, right? Those are founded or unfounded claims. And you had to write your claim in a particular way so that that adjudication could happen really quickly. Um, they were not going to get, they did not get involved in sort of complicated struggles over who should be compensated or who shouldn't be compensated. You had to learn how to present your grievance to the, to the company in a particular way. And so as people learned that, they also took up the language, they took up the framing, they took up the understanding of that the consortium introduced about who is eligible, who is not eligible, whether a tree is productive or unproductive, um, what a tree is worth, 
what kind of, you know, what species are more important than others, what crops are worth, and so on. And so it was around the grievance mechanism. That was one of the ways in which um, uh, disputes were domesticated or tamed. Um, another way was that those disputes had to be settled in families because the consortium paid um, a single person the compensation. They did not spread compensation over multiple people. They paid it only to the person who cleared the land. And that person had to, quote unquote, settle with others who might have claims to it. And so there is a, a whole chapter in the book that talks about, it's just about settling. Right? How did this happen? What it what happened in families as they had to pick up the mess that was left by you know one person in the family receiving a windfall payment, um, even though this is collectively owned land, this is family land, um, and you have to not only figure out how to allocate that payment, you have to live with each other after that. And in many families, um, land was expropriated multiple times over the course of this project. And so this was a recurrent, a recurrent set of dynamics in families, right? Um, that layered on top of each other. Um, the other part of domesticating disputes was keeping them physically away from um, production related activities. So away from the nerve center of the project and the field of operation. So they placed, the consortium placed local community contacts in villages. So if you had a complaint, you were going to your brother or your cousin or your neighbor, and you were adjudicating that complaint in your village. You were not going to the headquarters of the oil companies um, you were not going out to the um, uh, to the to to the well sites or the well pads where people were working. You were in your village and you were keeping those disputes domesticated or inside the village. So there were so the the compensation and resettlement plan in particular, the project more generally, um, generated a lot of conflicts among families or between families about land, the borders of land, um, and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, the other thing that I would and the other and I know we're just about out of time, so I'm going to be brief here. But the other um, the other dynamic that I think was really important in terms of facilitating the efficiency of the company was about distancing, detaching, and disengaging. Um, and Jamie Cross writes about this as an ethic of detachment. I look how corporations often operate with this ethic of detachment. And the place where it was most pronounced was around resettlement. Um, you know, in, in sort of the old literature on displacement, where, you know, dams are built and, you know, large infrastructures are built requiring the displacement of large groups of people. Um, resettlement is often sort of a state facilitated um, and uh, or even company facilitated um, uh, operation. Here, um, the oil companies advocated what they called self resettlement. Um, and they they used anthropology in a very instrumental way to, you know, they hired an anthropologist who said, you know, people in the South of Chad and the oil field region have always moved around. You know, they have, when their land, when their soils become less fertile, they just move. Well, that was true in the period from 1930 to 1980 when there were places to move to. Um, but all the land in Southern Chad is now, is now allocated. It's now spoken for as in many parts of, of uh, the continent and people had nowhere to move. Um, but the oil companies um, you know, provided a, lump, a, one, a one time lump sum cash payment and then said, mm, if you have no land, you can self resettle. That's one of the options for you. Um, and so the, the last thing that I will say is um, uh, in, in terms of distancing, detaching and disengaging. Um, and I think this was more uh, a public facing um, a public facing sort of um, uh, orientation, but the the oil companies mapped out all the land that they had taken. And they much of it was taken for temporary use to build pipelines, to build infrastructures, and then they returned it to villages. And so they had these quarterly reports where they would show um, how their, their impact in the oil field region had increased during the production period and then was slowly declining and receding and fading away. And the point was that for them, 
that that they could show how um, in the end they really had no impact at all because their physical footprint um, had been so so diminished to the point of you know almost no impact. And so there, there was this, um, I think that, that, you know, while they were erasing on paper their impacts on the land, I think what the book points out um, is the sort of many and very profound ways that the project left and still leaves um, its footprint in the region. So I'll, I'll, I will stop there and I would love to hear questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Is really very uh, fascinating, extremely, uh, almost entirely new to me, to be honest. And thank you so much for presenting it so clearly. And, uh, and uh, you know, what you said at the beginning about writing very well actually came through <laughs> in terms of how you presented it. So thank you so much for that. Uh, both of you did a very wonderful job and I'm actually quite interested in the connections that may be drawn between, you know, this apparently, uh, similar, but also in some ways very uh, uh, contrastable manner, but also but for that reason, uh, quite uh, comparable. And so um, uh, Alexi just told us that there are no questions yet, uh, but listening to both of you, I had uh, questions. And I will just ask a question of Omolade first, if I may, and then uh, ask one of you too. Uh, just so we can get things started and depending on what the traffic is like on YouTube, I might add uh, another one. So my question for uh, Omolade uh, has to do with uh, one of the first, the first of the three claims you made at the beginning uh, about what your book, Enclaves of Exception, uh, dealt with, the what you consider to be the main argument in the essay. And the one that I'm intrigued about is the one that has to do about how you established uh, an equivalence between state regulated special economic zones and the production of all the so-called uh, artisanal uh, refineries. Uh, because where, when these non-state refiners, if you want, uh, when they began their operation several years back, most public commentators in Nigeria characterized them negatively as oil bunkers and compared them to internet scammers and other uh, actors in, in piracy, such as uh, hostage takers. On the other hand, they, they described their own operations as an indigenous refinery or something like that. I remember reading about that a no, number of times. Uh, now, the reason I'm asking this question, the reason I'm interested, what I'm interested in is that your own characterization of these people is largely positive or at least a very objective. And I'm just interested in why you uh, seem to have an approach to it that's a bit, uh, at least tolerant, uh, not as dismissive as the public commentators in Nigerian media and uh, policymakers uh, thought of them at the beginning. So if you want to say something about that, I have several other questions for you, but I thought I would start with that because it's kind of controversial. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that uh, uh, question. Um, yeah, it's so part of my uh, objective in this book is to, uh, you know, to provoke a debate about what constitutes uh, uh, economic activities, and second, what constitutes an informal sector, and third, to also provoke a debate about uh, uh, neoliberalism itself. And uh, by one of the claims I made in the book is that uh, uh, it is a neoliberal regime that made it possible for the state to deregulate in such a way that uh, 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 free trade zones can emerge as a form of foreign direct investment. And that, you know, from my research, what I saw in the free trade zones that I studied is such that they operate like a semi-state. So they operate like a like an autonomous entity. Then when I went to the Delta to look at some of those refineries, the, the so-called artisanal refineries, and what I also saw there were similar to what I saw in the free trade zones in terms of the scale of operation and the ways in which enterprises are demarcated. So if you, so 
For example, when you get into a free trade zone, so each plot of land is demarcated as an enterprise that is owned by an individual. Okay. And when you get to an artisanal refineries, the refinery site, yeah, the one that I talked about today. So you also have each plot that is demarcated as an enterprise by the owners of uh, uh, the site. So in this particular instance, there are 47 of them. And when I ask, what do you think you guys are doing here? Yeah, so they see themselves as business people, just like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the free trade zone enterprises see themselves as business people. So they consider themselves as taking advantage of a neoliberal system that allows free market to thrive. So then the second point of the equivalency that I'm drawing here is that uh, we should not also forget the fact that many of the products that comes out of the refineries goes into the regular market, the Nigerian market. So therefore they are contributing in a way to the economy of the country. And I'll cite two examples. Um, when they produce a refined oil, then they sell, the retailers come, pick their products and sell to consumers. So we have to find a way of accounting for that economic activity that is also not, regula not regulated by the state, but contributing to state economic activities. So that is the reason why I said we need to draw an, a form of equivalency between these two, zone, these two zones. First, the way in which they are choreographed, you know, they, they operate as if they are independent entities. And that, that, there are a lot of similarities there. Then second, the ways in which they contribute to economic activities. So just to quickly follow up, uh, so in other words, they are not police, they are not surveilled, or there are no there are no attempts to actually smash them because, of course, you know, apart from being illegal, so to speak, they are yeah. also sort of uh, <laughs> at least um, competing for the market in ways that may actually make the market very tight and also sustainable from the point of view of uh, standard regulation. I mean, in other words, I'm just asking you, how come they've survived for this long? How come so, uh, uh, in, oh. chapter, in chapter four, chapter okay. three and four, I described the ways in which they survive in the business. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, they survive as a form of, as a result of their collusion with uh, state officials. So it is not as if the states don't pay attention to what they are doing. But at the same time, there are a lot of state officials who are benefiting from, uh, uh, from the trade. I use the example of uh, the current governor of uh, uh, River State, uh, Nason Wike, who in 20, before the 2019 election, he accused the, uh, the, the uh, commander of the Joint Tax Force in the state of allowing those artisanal refiners to thrive. Then the, the commander, you know, made his own counter accusation that the reason why Wike is accusing him of, of uh, uh, letting artisanal refineries thrive in River State is because of uh, Wike's demand that he should help him rig the 2019 election in favor of his own party and that he was ready to pay 1 billion uh, uh, naira for that purpose. So, but, uh, and if you follow the Nigerian news, they say exactly the same thing happened during this electoral circle, where we can, again came out to say that, uh, well, artisanal refineries are all over the place because the JTF people are colluding with uh, 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 the refiners. So uh, as I described in two of those chapters, these things do happen, but when, refineries are destroyed, destroyed in quote, in the, in the creeks, it is not because the state wants it destroyed. It is because they are not paying to the officials who are responsible for the destruction of these sites. Okay, interesting. 
Okay, which actually makes the question I have for uh, Laurie also quite relevant to this because the one that what, what struck me when I listened to the uh, presentation was the, the point about the compensation for lost trees and lands, uh, which I think was quite remarkable. Uh, and uh, in two respects. The first is for me, the idea that forestation uh, is naturally a top priority issue in a place like Chad. But I'm just wondering how much of that was a factor in the, in the conception of the idea of conception, or excuse me, the idea of compensation and whether the government of Chad or the locality where these uh, issues uh, were prominent had any particular stand on that. That's number one. The other is, is the uh, the issue of conflict between the individual compensations for uh, property lands that are actually collectively owned. Uh, you sort of mentioned that, but I'm just uh, interested in how much of that was a factor and whether you have some examples of how these were resolved or not resolved that uh, we can actually get a better sense of uh, the, the issue. So the question of uh, whether you know, a, a country like, like Chad that should actually prioritize you know, making the country less uh, uh, desert or desertified, uh, whether it actually had any kind of issue to, to weigh in on this issue of compensa compensating people for trees on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, within the families themselves, family collectively own lands, not individuals, but individuals are compensated. I just want to know of some concrete examples that you can share. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so desertification is a big problem. Uh, denuding the land is a big problem. Um, I think Chad is not the only place where um, fallow has, de you know, has declined. The amount of time people can afford to leave land in fallow has really declined. Soil fertility has pretty dramatically declined um, over time. Um, the, the government of Chad really had very little to do with the construction of the compensation and resettlement plan. Um, it was a series of consultants hired by the oil companies who came in and um, uh, sort of created, created that structure, created the framework for that. Um, the idea was really attached to labor. Um, if you're going to have a private property regime, I mean, if, if you, I mean, part of what I say in the book is that if you were to walk the oil field region with someone who lives there, they could tell you, um, you know, every inch of land who it belongs to, which family at least it belongs to. Um, the oil companies um, applied the idea of private property um, uh, on top of that. They did not, they did not, uh, um, acknowledge customary um, ownership of land. And so if you didn't have a piece of paper from, you know, the, the cadastre or the, you know, the office that allocates land, you didn't own the land itself. And of course, nobody in rural areas in Chad, you know, has privately held or owned land. They still don't, even after the pipeline project. And so what the oil companies were, were providing compensation for was not the land itself. It was never the land itself. It was only what was on the land, what you had. So if you had a beehive, if you had, you know, constructed some sort of um, uh, habitation, uh, you know, a, a place to stay, if you had um, grown crops, if you had if sowed something, even if it hadn't come up yet, if you had planted a tree, even at in some point in time and you were benefiting from the mangoes or the shea butter or the, you know, whatever it was that that tree was producing, that's what they, they calculated the market value of those kinds of objects um, and compensated you for them. Um, I think the huge, the loss of trees was, uh, the project resulted in a really significant loss of, of trees mm -hmm. in the region because there was there were a lot of roads that had to be created. There were lots of, at the end of the project, there were hundreds and hundreds of oil wells in the oil field region. And those, you know, require fairly sizable. They tried over time to shrink the size of the well pad, but, um, it required the clearing of a lot of trees. What the government of Chad did do was, um, uh, and this is related to uh, more recent, the more recent work, the gasomania work that I didn't have a chance to talk about, but what they did, what they have done is prohibit the production of charcoal. And so uh, people can no longer cut down trees to produce charcoal. They can't cut down trees anymore. Um, but that happened after Chad, um, 
with the help of the Chinese, built its refinery, which is north of N'Djamena. And so the government is now um, getting everybody on um, cooking gas that comes from the refinery. And so you can, even though you can still find charcoal in Indermena, um, and you actually, it's much like, much like uh, Lade's story that he just told. I mean, um, charcoal is needed because, you know, there are short, there, gasomania was really a, um, a piece about rupture and shortage. And what happens when that oil refinery can't produce the amount of gas that's needed to keep everybody in cooking gas in Indjamena? And that, that has made the state newly vulnerable. So to riots and protests and those kinds of things. And so it's also in their interest to allow some level of charcoal production, even if it's not on the massive scale that it used to be on. Um, and so the, the cross-border traffic in charcoal from Nigeria is shut down, but um, local production on a small scale um, and, and you know, women selling it openly in the market is still, as long as it's on a fairly small scale, is still allowed um, and needed and, and needed. Um, your second question was about um, conflicts over, yeah. yeah. So all uh, land in very little of the land, um, there's a, I do have a chapter where, okay, there's, there's a long history in Chad of, uh, of Southern Chad of cotton production. And the colonial regime um, had mandatory cotton cultivation in Chad. They assigned every adult one cord. It was a, the, the length of a, they call it a cord, but essentially, you know, half a hectare of land where they, that they had to put into production with cotton, every adult man, every adult woman. And so the people who cleared, when you clear the forest, that land becomes yours. Usually that's done in families. In the case of cotton production, that became personal land. So there was this sort of weird remnant of sort of personal, personal property, um, in the south of Chad, but very, very little of it, uh, relatively little of it compared to sort of family plots. Um, and so I think the oil companies, just to streamline their processes, they just wanted to identify one person to pay. So the person who had the land cleared, whether they did it manually or they paid someone to do it, that was the person they dealt with. That was the person they signed the contract with. That was the person they gave the compensation payment to, no matter how big it was. And then that person was left to figure out, you know, sometimes they were using the land. It was somebody else's land. Sometimes somebody else had planted the trees on it. Sometimes, you know, they could trace it to, you know, and, and one of the, I have a chapter called ties that bind, which is about how people in the oil field region didn't fully adopt the methods and the policies that the compensation that the oil companies introduced, mm -hmm. right? They also retied themselves to family members and ancestors and that kind of thing. And there was this, there was this very complicated back and forth. So they read social relations through the terms of the compensation and resettlement plan, but they did not jettison those social relations altogether. Mm -hmm. And so you would find these really complex, um, um, ways in which, and I, I have many of them uh, described in the book. I don't know how much time we have, Akin. But oh, it's gone. Uh, yeah, yeah, ways in which families would adjudicate these, these, um, these problems. So, um, you know, I have one case where um, a daughter was gone and her father received the compensation uh, payment when she was out of, out of, she was traveling and she heard about it. She came back to the village. She went to her father and said, that's mine, right? That's my compensation money. You must give it to me. And he said, no, I'm going to share it with the family. And she, she went to the village chief. The village chief had to, had to follow the rules that the consortium set for okay. other reasons that I, I describe here too. Um, and she, and, and she, you know, and people in the village were upset that she had sort of adopted the consortium's thinking about payments. And she said, no, I'm doing this because my father um, got a payment before me and he gave it all to our younger sister. And he loves, her name was Lonoji. He loves Lonoji best. He gave all the money to her and he shouldn't have done that. And so it was a, 
it opened up these possibilities for daughters to sort of reprimand their fathers in ways that they never could have done before. Um, and you had to look at these payments as sort of, um, you know, as layered and as every one of them, the response to them took into account the ones that had come previously. Yeah. Um, so they were very, very, um, uh, there was a lot of conflict. There was a lot of family conflict, but again, that's part of the domestication of dispute, right? It's keeping yeah. that conflict in the family and nobody's going to the, the oil companies to say, hey, we all own this land. You owe all of us something, or you have to figure out how to divide it up. All of that work sort of fell on families to figure out, which both which both facilitated right the the, the speedy work of the oil companies, but also um, just you know forced families to work through these really thorny issues. Okay. Interesting, which actually makes it very timely that there's a question from the uh, from YouTube from Professor Adelike Adeko. Uh, based on listening to you, says that it looks like Chadians are systematically assimilating the informer and into the former. And um, whether you actually share that view, uh, who is particularly struck by the observation that there's no communal land in southern uh, Chad anymore, is that an observation that you want to take up? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say there's no commun. I, I hope I didn't say that. I wouldn't say okay. there's no communal land in southern Chad anymore. I would say that. Um, there are two sort of land tenure regimes. Uh, you know, there's there's the the formal land tenure regime that the oil companies try to impose, right? Although without ever giving people title to land, so they did make every individual go out into the fields and walk the perimeters of their land. They took GPS devices, they tr they traced it so that they could create these really complex land maps. Um, uh, and, but there was no formal title to that land ever given. So for their purposes, for the purposes of tracking who to pay and how much land somebody had lost, because after you lost a certain proportion of your land base, then you were eligible for resettlement. And then that kicked in additional benefits and additional payments. And so the oil companies did all of that. They took they, they, they managed all of that. But over here, families, um, you know, never did. I mean, they never accepted that that was individual land, even though they had to play that game in order to get the compensation payment. Now, within families, they did, they did make calculations about who could clear that land. Like, who in this family can clear that land so that if they take it, we're not going to get nothing, right? Because the only way you got something was to show that you were using the land, that the land was, you know, that, that it was productive. Otherwise, they just considered it fallow land and available for the taking. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, Chadian families took up, um, you know, took up uh, the, 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 the task of of allocating, you know, this is the primary rights holder, right? Because this person can clear the land. But that didn't mean that that person got to hang on to the whole compensation payment without okay. a fight, at least. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So there are, as they say, there are borders essentially between fathers and sons in terms of who owns the land. Yeah. That's fascinating. Thank you. I'll come back to uh, to a question for you that arises for that, but I want to uh, I have another question for Omolade while we wait for uh, we're waiting for uh, our audience uh, online to, to pitch in. So uh, when I heard you, uh, 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 Lade, talking about the, the story that you shared about the former governor of Lagos and Dangote refinery, I found that quite fascinating uh, because unlike the example from the Niger Delta, the, the governor essentially dismissed uh, the popular will because he asked this uh, <laughs> this question, do you want a uh, refinery? And he said, no. And he said, well, whether you like it or not, you have it. And so he was successful in imposing his own will. Uh, so, I mean, what do you think I can for this? Is it, I mean, I guess I'm just trying to see or hear you talk about disparity between these two economic zones where there was a greater deal of governmentality in Lagos or the, the Dangote refinery. Whereas there is 
uh, a similar kind of governmentality in the Niger Delta, but less police, less uh, imposing, in, in, uh, less top down from the point of view of the of the governor. I mean, you mentioned Wiki, but it was like on the sideline in terms of how I mean, the governor of Lagos essentially sort of made sure that there was a. So there's, I guess, I, I'm just interested in what is that. Uh, at stake here, where the governor could successfully, through, you know, the question of regulation or regulatory uh, mechanism, make it possible for uh, for the refinery to be built. Whereas what you have in the night data is quite different. So, are there comparable examples, or I mean, how do you weigh these two moments together? Yeah. So, uh, for the former governor, you remember the, the free trade zone was actually a project uh, uh, initiated by the president-elect now, uh, uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, when he was governor of Lagos. Yep. And he launched this uh, uh, in 2005 in partnership with uh, the China National Engineering uh, uh, Corporation, which is a state-owned uh, uh, corporation in China as well as uh, 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 the Lekki Worldwide uh, uh, International, which is uh, an organization or a business uh, 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 put in place by the Lagos state government. So uh, the idea of the free trade zone is for, uh, for, you know, for the Lagos state government, it, it is uh, a notion that will bring uh, uh, development, particularly infrastructural development to Lagos state, and uh, also invite a lot of foreign direct investments to Lagos. So uh, then fast forward to when uh, Fashola was uh, uh, the governor of Lagos, Dangote had uh, actually wanted to uh, establish uh, the refinery in the Olokola free trade zone in Undo state, uh, which is a federal government project in partnership with uh, the Undo state uh, uh, government. But, uh, uh, Tinobo and uh, Fashola were able to convince uh, uh, Dangote to bring up uh, uh, the refinery to Lagos. And when Dangote muted the idea of the refinery in uh, the Lekki area of Lagos, uh, a lot of the communities there who had already been displaced by the free trade zone that was already in existence didn't want another free trade zone, because the refinery is a free trade zone, actually, and not, uh, uh, technically, it is uh, in Nigeria, but not also in Nigeria. And I can uh, 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 say a little bit about this, if there is time, why I say it's in Nigeria, but not also in Nigeria. So, but to, you know, to come back to the story of Fashola, Fashola went to the community, and he thought he was going to be welcomed by members of the community because uh, he thought he was going to be celebrated as someone that is bringing development to their community. And rhetorically, he asked the question, do you all want the refinery? And he was shocked when they all echoed, no, we do not want the refinery. And at that point, he now said, whether you want it or not, we're going to build this refinery here. And if you don't like it, you can leave. But of course, members of the community continued to protest against the refinery, against the building of the refinery there. So, uh, but the difference between that and the refineries in the Niger Delta Creeks is that for the Niger Delta Creeks, these refineries are largely operated by former insurgents, then in partnership with members of the community, then sometimes the enterprises within the refineries are owned by politicians because it is a money-making venture for, uh, for many of them. And there are two aspects of it. There is the crude, uh, 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 crude extraction aspect, which I described in, uh, I think, chapter three of the book, we, uh, and this is the practice that I call the tapping practice. And what that means is that, you know, that is the most lucrative part of the business. So for the insurgents, they own a lot of these tapping points that are located within the creeks. And these tapping points basically mean tapping from an existing infrastructure owned by the multinational corporations to get crude. And when they get crude, 
there is a different market for that. And the market for that sometimes is local and sometimes it's also international. So the international part goes to places like Kutonu, and which is why the boat that is used in taking this uh, 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 crude to the, international, to the international waterways is called the Kutonu boat. So once they take it to the international waterways, then their customers who are mostly Chinese and mostly Ukrainians will come there to meet with them and take the crude to the international market. So they make, so it's a money, and that is what is called bunkering and it's been going on for several years in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But uh, the new aspect of it that is introduced is the, you know, local, is the localization of the practice through these artisanal refineries that it is no longer about taking crude to the international market, but it's also about refining it locally and taking some of the refined products also to places like uh, Better Republic, Togo, and other West African uh, 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 countries for sale. And also selling to the, uh, the, the you know, gas stations that are licensed by the state itself. Mm -hmm. So when I ask my, you know, when I ask them, no one will say that we are buying from the refineries but it's a money-making venture for those gas stations mm. because you can buy at a cheaper rate from them. And what they do is when they buy, then they dilute with the one they buy from the regulated mm. refined products from the state. And that means more profit and more money for them. So that, those are the, you know, the similarities that I see in both spaces. Yeah, which is actually interesting. Thank you for saying that. Uh, that they, I mean, we know that Nigerian refineries no longer work. Like, I mean, we know. And that's apart from the fact that the government is insistent on imposing or removing subsidy, the recurrent uh, scarcity that Nigeria experiences is partly because of the state of the refinery. So it's actually quite interesting, fascinating, maybe not in a good way, not in the way we want that these uh, artisanal refineries are actually more productive <laughs> and they are selling their products in ways that the, the, the uh, regular refineries, the one in Kaduna or Port Harcourt do not. You know? So I think that's a, that's a, uh, a very uh, uh, curious way of thinking about, well, I don't want to use the, the word uh, failed nation because first state because that's actually doesn't apply here something else is at work but uh i thought I'll, I'll make that comment there's a question for both of you that is on on youtube and uh the, the that is posted to the chat box and i just want you to take turns to speak about that this is actually like uh, trying to think in terms of the aesthetic dimension of uh, especially question of land. So whether there are stories that, or songs or some kind of artistic uh, byproducts, so to speak, from these processes, especially in a place like church that uh, you want to share with us, <laughs> right? As ethnographers, as people actually also serve as, um, or work as um, operators, uh, participant observers. I'll go first. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I think um, I haven't heard new songs yet, but I, there may well be. Okay. Um, but I would say there's new language and uh, there are, there's new language and there's new stories. And this is part of the back and forth of adopting, picking up, absorbing some of the nomenclature, the language, the framing um, that was introduced by ExxonMobil and others. And so people now regularly talk about trees as productive or non-productive. You know, just as a modifier in okay. a way that people did not before. That was not a notable, you know, productive, non-productive because they're too young, right? Or um, young, it's a young tree, it's a mature tree. People didn't talk that way before the compensation and resettlement plan. They've adopted the, the, the this is a field that's bush, right? In a way that people would, would not have talked about that distinction in the past. And it comes up in conversations that have nothing to do with, with compensation and resettlement. It's just a different way to view the landscape um, that has come about from imbibing 
you know, the, the, the categories that the compensation and resettlement plan introduced. So I'm, there probably are songs and stories that, um, that, that I'm just not aware of yet, but there's certainly a different way of, of experiencing, viewing, and talking about the landscape. Yeah, in the case of uh, 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 the Niger Delta, uh, for example, uh, there are no songs that I've come across, but uh, I've also seen uh, a lot of memes and cartoons online that uh, they use in describing uh, the precarious situation uh, that a lot of the communities are under in many of the uh, Niger Delta creeks. So uh, one example is uh, about soot that I described in the book, which is a particulate matter that flies around. So I've seen a lot of uh, uh, cartoons uh, about soot where, for example, they might say, uh, if you are going for an interview in Port Harcourt or you are going for an interview, for a job interview in any parts of the Niger Delta, make sure that you are well suited. So well suited, rather than the S-U-I-T-E-D, they will put S-O-O-T-E-D, that is, uh, uh, which is a uh, suit, then plus the, word, the, the two letters, E-D. And, uh, and that uh, uh, then you might see images that will say, if you live in Port Harcourt, well, residents, they come in different shapes and sizes. And in this image, you might see the description of how people's bodies are covered with uh, a, a suit, which is like a, a blackish uh, powdery substance. And you see different sizes and different shapes there. Then the other one that I've seen uh, uh, recently is uh, you know, a cartoon that also depicts suit that says that, you know, and it shows, uh, if for those who are familiar with Nigeria or motor park scenes in, uh, in places like Lagos or anywhere in Nigeria, you know that when you are traveling interstate, then if there is a stop or uh, a portal somewhere, you will see a lot of uh, street traders come to you to display their wares. Then some of these uh, uh, images will show street traders coming to you that, hey, you are heading to the Niger Delta, buy your anti-suit cream. You will never regret it. But if you fail to buy it, you might regret it by the time you come back. So these are some of the uh, uh, images that I've seen displayed in many parts of uh, uh, the area. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, to actually follow up on that, because one thing that also sort of struck me as I looked at the images that uh, Laurie shared at the beginning was the fact that these were, if you want, material afterlives of this uh, process of uh, the kind of operations that the oil companies in Chad were, were putting in place. And what makes me think of that as uh, relevant was that in in Walter Rodney's uh, history of the Upper Guinea Coast, one of the observations he makes at the towards the end was the fact that the that the Atlantic slave trade actually had material afterlives, uh, like the bottles of uh, jeans and other things that the, those who uh, participated in the slave trade, the the big chiefs in in places like uh, today Sierra Leone and uh, Southern Guinea, who were Things that later were made into to use to make beads, to make uh, other kinds of accessories, and I'm just wondering whether those objects that are now being used in charge in, uh, in in domestic settings beyond the merely functional ones, whether in fact that's a similar kind of observation that that we can make. I mean, it's clear that people using signages as uh, seats count as functional uses, but I'm just interested in whether there are some kind of aesthetic afterlives that this material culture is uh, is creating. And I think that uh, both of you may actually have something that's beyond these uh, immaterial representations of songs or language, whether there are also material ways in which we can think about this. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's a question that actually 
spurred my next research project, was, which is on the used car trade okay. um, <laughs> from, from the US, Europe, and Japan to the African continent. But I'm really looking at um, the US and Europe to West Africa um, more broadly. Um, so yeah, I think one of the interesting things, I mean, we did a, one of the many surveys we did was just to sort of take an inventory of all the stuff that was in people's concessions that wasn't, that came from the project, right? And almost every, uh, many of the households were, you know, had three, four, five, six things that, that, that came from the project. Um, one of the really interesting things was the, and it continues to be, the collection of, of metal for scrap, um, that there's not a foundry or there's, in, in, at least in N'Djamena, um, that is sort of shipped back to Nigeria actually, um, and made into construction materials, rebar and other things that are, um, that are used for, you know, to, 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 to build homes. And so what, what I found in the used car trade is when cars are disassembled or when they uh, are uh, the parts are all the useful parts are all taken out and you know um uh, put into other cars but then you have the carcass you know you have the the body of the car um and the that is sort of those primary materials are really useful for people for for other purposes like building right and in a place like chad where there is no you know, there's no local production. Um, you know, people keep cars on the road for as long as possible, but then they they can sell that that scrap metal, um, and and elsewhere on the continent, at least, it's made into building materials that then comes back to Chad, and so you know, and Chadians pay a much higher price for it than I'm sure you do in Nigeria. But so I would say that some of those, um, there's certainly uh, there, in the oil field region today, you will still see. Um, remnants of the the, the oil project, um, just like you will see. Uh, you know, the other thing that I've worked on is a documentary of um, soldiers from Chad who fought in World War II, and it's really interesting how the the uniforms and the 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 um, the badges and the medals and the you know how those things continue to circulate and to be displayed and to be part of sort of the the history of families and of and of the region because most of the soldiers who fought in world war ii um, came from the southern part of chad where the oil pipeline and, and further to the east but from the southern part of chad um, so I think there's going to be a very, very long afterlife of, of the of the material artifacts. That was the thing that I, I continued to think about. Um, and and uh, you know the, the 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 circulation and the ways that people you know we talk a lot now about circular economy you know those of us in environmental studies and the ways in which people you know can can maintain cars on roads and you know part of the questions many part, some of the questions that I'm asking now are about how do you think about roadworthiness in relation to you know environmental pollution or how do you think about it in relation to to public safety, or how do you think about it in relation to the need for transportation? How are families sort of adjudicating um, those different needs um, in in African cities, where you know, the, as cities are expanding and urbanization is progressing, there are more and more needs for public transportation. If you don't have public transportation, you need inexpensive vehicles, you need used cars, and you need to keep those things on the road. Um, so anyway, that was a long-winded and sort of circuitous way of answering yeah. your question. But but I think there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. There, there's a material afterlife of this project that will go on in many different forms. Some of them not even traceable to the project, which is like the 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 metal the metal recycling. Okay, anyway, thank you, uh, Ladi. Anything to add? So uh, yeah, uh, just a few points to add. Okay. Uh, Three things that came to my mind when you asked up uh, the question. Uh, the first is uh, when I started the research uh, uh, in the Niger Delta about uh, the artisanal refineries, the first site that I went to is in Ogoni land. And uh, uh, as you remember, in Ogoni land, after the protest in 1993, all of the uh, oil platforms and flow stations were shut down by Shell. 
And uh, so by the time I started this research, uh, uh, this you could call the afterlife of uh, uh, some of the oil infrastructure in the zone. So I saw that a lot of the artisanal refineries in places like uh, the creeks of Bori uh, were making use of the abandoned oil infrastructure by Shell. Hmm. So they found good use for some of those wellheads because they were able to tap uh, crude oil from, you know, even though Shell abandoned them, but that doesn't mean that oil is no longer available in those pipes. And the, uh, the uh, youths in that area found good use for uh, by the infrastructure that was left behind by, um, um, uh, by Shell. Then the second thing that came to my mind is the technology itself, the techniques of extracting oil. And this I described in uh, one of the chapters of the book, that this technique can also be seen as a form of afterlife of uh, Ogogoro brewing, for example. Uh, Ogogoro, it, uh, the local liquor that is uh, brewed uh, uh, in many parts of uh, the Niger Delta and of course in many parts of Nigeria. But the technology that is used by many of those who design these refineries are derived from the same technology that is used to brew Ogogoro. And what, this, uh, what these guys did was to, to study the similarity between uh, uh, alcohol brew or liquor brewing and refining. And they saw that it is actually similar. It's the same process. But only that in scale, it, we, you just have to scale up the materials that you use to make it, uh, 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 to make it uh, uh, appropriate for refining oil. And that was what they did. And many of them told me that, look, that they've been part of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Ogogoro brewing practice of their parents. So they learned the trade from their parents. And when they saw that this, the technology is similar, that they had to apply the same to how they design their artisanal refineries, mm. which is uh, quite innovative to me. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, this is fascinating and we could go on. We're actually <laughs> at the end of our time and I have several other questions, but I think it's actually uh, uh, quite uh, polite to, uh, to, to run this off because uh, I was just thinking about how, what you were saying now, uh, remind is reminiscent again, just uh, as an example from from uh, Upper Guinea Coast, of what was going on in the so-called oil rivers back in the uh, early mid middle of the nineteenth century, before the former colonization of Nigeria. You find that actually the same kind of uh, approach to control of local resources were being repeated now. Uh, in fact, it's quite quite fascinating, and uh, I'm glad to know to hear from. Uh, from Lori, the, the material uh, afterlife is a very, uh, has ramifications beyond the present. And so uh, it would be nice to, to hear more, to read more from you about how this uh, project sort of shape up. But thanks so much for sharing this with us. Uh, as I said uh, in my first question, some of these materials are actually extremely new to me, you know, and I consider myself fairly uh, interested in these areas to be so, sufficiently informed. But, Thank you, uh, and thanks for sharing this with us in a very accessible and uh, uh, agreeable uh, manner. So thank you very much, and um, hope you uh, have the rest of your day. And thank you again to um, Alexi for helping us uh, look at the back uh, end of the, of the YouTube channel. So uh, thanks to Professor Lori Leonard and Professor Maladi Adumbi for sharing your research with the African Literature Association. And, Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having me. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Take care.